Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for an evening in Malibu with Taylor Jenkins Reid. We are so excited for tonight's conversation celebrating the release of Malibu Rising with a special conversation between Taylor, Taylor and Camila Marone. Please connect with other readers and guests using the chat function. We'd love to hear your thoughts, what you're reading, and how you're taking care of yourself right now. We just ask that everyone please stay respectful in the chat. Random House has enabled auto-generated closed captions for this evening's event. To access the closed captions, please click live transcript at the bottom of your screen. Please bear with us. These captions are auto-generated, so they may not be 100% accurate, but we will do our best. We would like to quickly thank this evening's bookseller, Diesel, a bookstore located in Santa Monica, California, for sending out everyone's copy of Malibu Rising. I am honored to introduce our author and moderator this evening, Taylor Jenkins Reid and Camila Marone. Taylor Jenkins Reid is the New York Times bestselling author of seven novels, including Daisy Jones and the Six and The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. She lives in Los Angeles with her husband and their daughter. Camila Marone can currently be seen as the lead of the independent film, Mickey and the Bear, directed by Annabelle Antoncio and opposite James Badge Dale, which premiered at, at uh, South by Southwest to glowing reviews and sold to Utopia at the 2019 Cannes Film Festival. The film holds 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Following her performance in Mickey and the Bear, Cammy was named as one of Variety's prestigious 10 actors to watch for 2019, as well as W Magazine's best performances in 2020. Her credits include MGM's remake of Death's Wish, directed by Eli Roth and opposite Bruce Willis, and MGM's upcoming remake of Valley Girl. And now, may I present An Evening in Malibu with Taylor Jenkins Reid and Camila Marone. Hi. Hello. How are you? Taylor, how are you? I'm so happy to be with you today. I am really stoked that you're doing this. I feel like uh, there's a lot of cool stuff for us to talk about. There's a lot of cool stuff for us to talk about, mainly because we know each other because I'm doing Daisy Jones and the Six and I'm playing Camilla. And yes, I, which I just still can't get over that your Camilla playing Camilla is amazing to me. So perfect. Oh, people that they're like well you were meant to get the role I'm like well I wish it was that easy I wish the audition <laughs> meant to get the role but um I'm so excited and um I was just telling telling you right before this that I just finished your other book Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo which is one of my favorite books and now I quickly read Malibu Rising so that we could do this and I only I've just been in your brain for two weeks now just reading your writing and living in your very creative, fun, spontaneous brain. So I've had a really good past two weeks. Well, that's nice of you to put it that way. I feel like me living in my own brain is chaos. So I'm glad for, I'm glad for you, it felt exciting. It felt like getting out of my brain, which has its own chaos. So it was great to go into yours for a little bit. <laughs> realizing that I actually don't even have a signed copy of this, Taylor. How could I not? Me? We got to get you a signed copy. That will be easy sad this is like the first page of my book i don't have any taylor jenkins reads <laughs> so we'll get it on there for you i'm sad about that um well i want to start asking you questions and um then we're gonna get to our q a which should be fun and we can just go crazy and ask each other a bunch of questions i love it let's uh, do it Malibu Rising is your seventh novel. I've read three out of your seven, so I am catching up. Um, for those who don't know, what is the book about and what inspired you to write this particular book? Malibu Rising is really the story of the Riva family. And it's the story about these four adult siblings in particular, Nina, Jay, Hud, and Kit, who are famous surfers, children of a famous father who left them uh, when they were children. And so it's the story of as adults, they're making their way in the world. They're reckoning with a lot of things that have happened to them in the past. And every single summer they throw the Riva party. And in the summer of 1983, the Riva party grows so wildly out of control that the cops show up and arrest you know, 15 famous people and the house is trashed and, and everything ends up in flames. And so uh, the book is the story of that day, taking you from 7 a.m. 
hour by hour through this family's day to understand everything that they've gone through and why tonight everything is coming to the surface. I think it's really cool, Taylor, how like I'm just thinking when when Daisy Jones, like all the styles of Daisy and Evelyn and like Malibu Rising, Rising are so different. Like Daisy was, you know, a conversation and it was always, you know, each character had its own little paragraph and a couple pages. And that was in the 70s in L.A. and late 60s. And then we have, you know, Evelyn Hugo, which spanned through her entire life pretty much. And it flip flop back and forth. And then this is like in 24 hours, which I've never read a book like that, which is really telling the story of one day. But yet you manage to go back to each character's moment of birth and, and beyond, which I think is, is really cool how you, how you intertwine that. And, you know, are you from L.A., Taylor? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm from Massachusetts, but I, I moved out here uh, a long time ago now. I, I was 21 when I first moved out here and I've been here since. And uh, so I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere. Um, and it, yeah. is, it is my home. Yeah, I'm a true Angelino born and raised in Los Angeles. So all of your stories feel very like true to kind of like my upbringing and, and knowing LA as well as I do, having lived here and having lived in so many different parts. Like I just recognize when they're driving down the Sunset Strip, I live, you know, just a few minutes from there when they're driving down the PCH. And it's a very like LA style of, of not writing, but it's very true to real Angelinos, the way that you know LA inside out. So I'm giving you props right now from a real Thank Angelino. You. Thank you. I will take that. My my husband is from Los Angeles and his family has lived here for a number of generations. And I've definitely learned a lot from them as well as, you know, my own sense having lived here. But one of the things that was really nice about writing Malibu Rising was that I really got to dig into writing about that part of Los Angeles, which yeah you know, as you know, is so different than the rest of Los Angeles. It's really unique and it's and it's its own thing in its own feeling. And it's, you know, just one of my favorite places. And so being able to take, hopefully to be able to take people that haven't been there or don't know Los Angeles the way that we do, they can feel like, you know, they're a part of it too. Yeah, and, and Malibu is really such a different thing, which is weird because you'd think like from the center of, of LA, you're only 30, 40, 45 minutes from, from Malibu, but there's this kind of like community, which is what Kit, Jay, and Hud, and Nina all, all grew up in. It, it's kind of isolated, and it's very, um, you know, growing up knowing that things catch on fire. I love the way that that's how the book starts, and that's how the book ends, kind of just like knowing that Malibu is so fragile and delicate, and at any moment can be lost is kind of this gives all these characters this appreciation um, of where they're from and, and the access to the beach and the way that you talk about what it's like to live in Malibu and how you only have one road driving through. <laughs> yeah. and yeah I just felt like you did a really good good job with um, kind of people who putting people who haven't been there in in that real Malibu mentality as you would call it. Well, thank you. And and I think one of the other things about Malibu that you touched on that I think is so important, and um, I'm currently living in Topanga. I normally live in the valley, but but I'm renovating my house. And so I'm staying in the in the mountains for a little while. And, you know, it's just Ma Malibu can easily catch fire. This is an area that we have to be very gentle with and we have to treat this earth with respect and 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 understand that it's fragile and yeah. And the the past couple of years, there's been a lot of things that have happened that are because people aren't being fragile with this earth and, and this particularly delicate space, which is, you know, we're rewarded by how beautiful it is. The mountains and the ocean and all of it is um, really, really uh, just dazzling, but we, we have to treat it with respect and, and we're not always doing that. I don't know how much I'm allowed to say if, if everyone here has gotten the chance to read the book yet, but I, I have Yeah, I don't think they have. Yeah. So, so we're, we're trying not to do spoilers, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm seeing chats come in saying they haven't finished. Yeah. So, so we'll talk around it. Yeah. I won't tell you who lights the fire at the end of the film. I'll let everyone make it. <laughs> Um, I want to ask you about Mick Riva, because just having come off Evelyn Hugo, when I was reading this, because it's so fresh in my mind, I was reading this and I was like, Mick Riva, wait, 
wait, McReva, I know a McReva. And then I was like, <laughs> that's Evelyn's, you know, one night husband in, in yeah. Vegas. And I thought that I had discovered that and I had put that connection together and it was like some super genius connection, but apparently it's not. And you've talked about him and Daisy too, which leads me to what is it about McReva? Because you have so many characters in all of your books. I mean, even in just, just the last 30 pages, we introduced, you introduced 20 yeah. different characters in Malibu Rising. So, so what about him made you want to tell his story and his family's story? That's a really good question. I, the The big thing for me was that when I wrote The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, and, and I won't give anything away, but um, for the people that have read it, the chapter in which Evelyn marries Mick and her reasons for marrying Mick and the way that she goes about that were to me the most important in the book in terms of the reader understanding who she is and what she's willing to do and, and how she operates. And I just had the time of my life writing that particular chapter. And I was really fascinated because we only see it from Evelyn's point of view. Um, yeah. I was really sort of fascinated by Mick. He, he, I didn't like him and he got under my skin and it bothered me the way that he spoke and the things that he did. And so he, he just sort of stuck in my mind. And then when I was writing Daisy Jones, one of the things that I wanted to do was when Daisy's at the throwing the pool party at the Chateau, I was going to put somebody there just just to speak to, um, you know, how wild the party was getting. And I was like, well, I'll just put McReva there because he's a jerk and, and everyone knows he's a jerk and has low expectations for his behavior. And so and so then when it came, okay, I want to write about a famous family and I want to write about the children that have been left behind by a famous man. And then I was thinking, well, who's the famous man who would leave his children behind? And immediately it was Mick Reba. Mm -hmm. And it all came together for me in this really exciting way because what it did was it allowed me to write about one particular thing that I think was the reason Mick was sticking in my head. And that is that there are certain men in this world that if you are charming enough or you are rich enough or you are handsome enough, we will trip over ourselves to make excuses for your behavior. We as a society will allow a certain type of man to just walk all over everyone and not be held accountable for their actions. And I wanted to write about not only how, how does that man function in the world, but also who are the women who are left behind picking up the pieces yeah. when a man like McReva is allowed to do whatever he wants. It reminds me a little bit of Camilla in Daisy Jones and the Six. There were a lot of parts of June in this that reminded me a lot of, of my character, of the character of Camilla and Daisy, because there's such strength in the woman that can get left by the man. There's mm -hmm. strength can forgive the man who comes back and give him another chance and there's so much strength in the woman that stays back and doesn't have the glamorous life and and gets her heart broken a million times over but stays for her children and and both june and camilla feel very grounded in that way which i think is why people really love camilla and daisy and why they really love june in this in this book at least i really love june she's like maybe even my favorite character um yeah i just think it's really beautiful how you portray what some people might you know, perceive as the weak woman who stays with the cheating rock star and, yeah. and turn it into, that's one of the strongest characters in the book. Th thank you for saying that. I I feel, a, I, I love that you picked up on that because to me, Camila and June are two sides of the same coin. And, yeah. and that's actually because I think Billy and Mick are two sides of the same coin. What I really wanted to explore with both of their characters is if you have this tendency, if you're a man and, and your father left you uh, and you have maybe this tendency that you may do the same thing to your children, to me, yeah. Billy is the man who looks inside and says, this is unacceptable and I'm going to change and, and, and fixes himself before he does something that he can't take back. Mick has never done that. And yeah, so, yeah. and I think in, it's in no small part because Billy has Camila who yeah. will not accept 
Billy doing anything other than what she wants Billy to do, which is one of my favorite things about Camila. I think a lot of times people be like, oh, Camila's perfect. She's she'll just stand by Billy. And it's like she's I don't see her as perfect. I see her as very, very strong and controlling in this way that excites me. Um, June does not have that. Yeah, and I felt that. I was like, June, be stronger. Come on, yeah. you like, oh, take him back. How are you buying this? Like, I, reading it, I was like, please, June, don't do this to yourself. Yeah. Um, that, like, you know, you're just like biting your nails, and, and we can so obviously see it, but he's yeah. so committed, so convincing in that moment. And he comes in for a minute, he implants himself in, in, you know, Nina's life. And oh, I don't know how much to say without spoiling, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was very interested in, in Mick Reva. Now I'm going to have to go back and, and see where I can find him in Daisy because I read Daisy over two years ago and I didn't know who Mick was at the time. And now I have to go back and track. You know, track. You know what? I can do this for everybody right now because I've been asked about this and I know exactly where it is. Oh my uh, God. <laughs> I can tell. I'm going to give everybody the page number, um, which is, let's see. Uh, it is... It's around like 200 or so, I think. Um, it's when it's right, but it's right before they Billy writes Impossible Woman. So whenever, whatever page that's on in the paperback. Um, it, but it, it also kind of um, this the writing of Mal the writing in Malibu Rising. Mm -hmm. I did not kind of of the writing and Knives Out. And the reason that I say that is not because it's a murder mystery or anything, but it's this complex family dynamic and there's all these parallel stories happening at the same time. Yeah. And then, you know, when that thing happens at the party later and every single per, you know, all the four kids are in their own world with all their secrets unraveling. It kind of reminded me of that, of that like joyride watching Knives Out and watching all these different stories unfold. I love that you're saying that because I loved Knives Out. I loved the, I mean, I love any good family yeah. story. Um, and also just Knives Out. Maybe it's just because I haven't been able to go to a movie theater in so long, but it was like one of the last great movies I saw in the theater. So it just like makes me so happy. Um, the answer is on the paperback page 179. So if anyone wants to find Mick Riva, he's there. And, you know, no. if you already read Malibu, you can go back to page 179 and see that I was giving you some clues about some things. That's so cute that you're planting, planting clues and three books later, here we are. I like <laughs> I, I'm, I'm nothing if not uh, neurotic and obsessive about these things. You have to be really neurotic and obsessive. Like I think my brain, in order to get all of these different character dynamics and family, uh, family rising, Malibu rising, I would have to do like a brain chart and be like, this person's having an affair with this person. This person had a child with this person. Like I would have to do like some family tree with little legs. Yes. Sticking like I mean, I, ha I have full notebooks full of this stuff. And, um, and I think it was, yeah, during Daisy Jones, I had this graph that I'd made with all of these arrows of like, what sort of relationship does this person have with this person? Or, or even specifically with Camila, you know, it was it was like, well, who in the band does Camila trust? You know, like who and and just what's her relationship with each member of the band? I'm always thinking these things out ahead of time. And then honestly, I'm so disorganized that when I go back and I read the book, I'm like, oh, God, did I make sure that even tracks? Like, I don't trust myself that I did the work, but I but it always ends up that I did. But there's a lot to keep straight. If you ever need to make like a tree man to like understand everyone. <laughs> like dynamics I can help you with that I feel like I can have like my <laughs> drawing skills would really come in handy with that all would your be great. I'd like to make your life very difficult with a lot of characters in one book <laughs> yes so, this one was a lot yes props to you um I wanted to know how you were able to create four siblings and each have such a different personality. Did you grow up with a lot of siblings? Is this a story that's familiar to you? I'm an only child. So seeing a family with all these different complexities and brothers and sisters that are this close is so fun for me because it's so not what I had growing up. Yeah. Um, I love hearing stories about siblings. It's, it's what makes, you know, makes me happy. I want to interview you later about being an only child because my daughter's an only child and half the time I'm like, this is a brilliant idea. And the other half, I'm like, what have I done? 
very next book about an only child and I can be that child. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Actually, my next book is about an only child. So there you go. Great. You can name it after me again. You can name it after Camilla. Done. But yeah, what, what are the roles and personalities of all these different Riva siblings and how did, you know, develop that early on? And, and did it happen once you started writing? Did you have these people who they were before? How does that work? Yeah. Um, you know, I think the, the beginning of this for me was Nina. I really wanted to tell a story about a woman, specifically sort of an eldest daughter archetype. What is, you know, Nina is the person who picks up the pieces. She's the one who always does the hard thing, who does the right thing, who sacrifices herself in order to help her siblings. And, and so she was the beginning of it for me. And ultimately to me, this is her story. As much as it is a story about a family, we're, we're watching Nina come to a breaking point in her life for maybe the first time that she's really reached this level. And so I designed Nina. And then the question was, okay, well, who are the siblings that she's been taking care of? And that's when Jay, Hud, and Kit came together. And what I really, I think part of it is I spent a lot of time with them. Um, you know, I, I created them and they're not real, but they feel very real to me. And so looking back on it, I remember thinking, okay, well, Jay's naturally going to be like this hot shot, thinking he's like his dad and Hud's going to be softer and the one that Nina can kind of rely on and the one that when things are going crazy, he's he's the only one making sure Nina's okay. Um, and then and then Kit hasn't been hit with the same wounds as her older siblings because she was younger when a lot of it happened and she has had three people to rely on. So I think that makes her a little bit less afraid and a little bit gutsier. And um, so they all they all formed in relation to each other. But when I look at them now or I think about them now, I I have to admit, as silly as it sounds, they really feel like who they had to be um and i i just have such affection for them i'm i'm really excited that i don't have to put them down just yet because because we've sold it to hulu and and so there's some more life here and i just i want to spend more time with these characters yeah i also think that Nina is, you know, the story that you're telling. And, and it's, it's interesting, it's not a coming of age. It's like a coming of who you really wanted to be and should have been your whole life. But yeah. circumstances didn't allow you to be. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and she, she, you know, she's such a cool character. And, and it's interesting too, that whole element that you kind of snuck in of men kind of taking advantage of her and, um thinking that maybe they own a piece of her because of her public image yeah. uh because you know posed for a photo shoot and men had photos of her on her wall and the men coming up to her and touching her and and i just think that that's such you know uh it's it's such an interesting way to like kind of dabble in a, a societal thing of you know people feeling like they own a celebrity or a part of them and and Nina handles it, you know, very well because Nina handles most things very well. But I, I liked that you had dabbled kind of that no longer ownership of, of yourself with Nina, which is what, you know, she ends up maybe or maybe or maybe not discovering at the end. We were not going to say. Yeah, no, no, I, I think it's and I think it's it's both her body, which is the most obvious thing. She's a model and yeah. but but it's. It's also, you know, a lot of my books are about fame. And I think one of the things that I hadn't yet talked about that I am excited about putting into this book is that there is a sense of ownership that people have over celebrities, that that we feel that we are owed the truth about their lives or access to um, them or their attention or whatever it is. And and uh, it is it is the the there are many um bad sides to fame it's a complicated thing but it's one of the things that i you know it's not so easy i think to be nina riva and that your money is is made from people selling photos of you and so because of that they think they can touch you um yeah. emily redikowski wrote an amazing essay a couple of months ago about this that i found so moving um yeah, i read 
mentioned that she has a really good perspective on on kind of female ownership and she's obviously kind of had a similar experience to Nina Riva um, in terms of yeah selling an image and then it goes you know has a life beyond just what you approved of that image and and right. it's kind of a little nod to some some stuff that I think women are going through yeah through today but you know talking about fame which is a subject that you love and being in LA you see a lot of fame it <laughs> seems like LA <laughs> revolve around fame in some sort of way so I was yeah. going to like you throw a stone and you hit an actor or producer yeah. or writing a writer or you know we're in Hollywood so this is this is our life but um I felt like what is the what is the message that you would want to take from the Emily Ratajkowski, from the Nina Riva, from the women taking kind of their own independence like what do you want the young woman reading this who maybe doesn't feel ownership of themselves yet not nothing to do with with fame but what do you feel like you want the young 14 15 year old girl to learn from Nina that'd be a, that'd be a good question what what what, are, what yeah. do you want Nina for, like her one life lesson thank you I I have never been asked this question I love this question and let me preface this by saying that what I'm seeing of the younger generation and the 14 year olds of today is that they do not need advice from me. They are so phenomenally self-possessed. Um, yeah. I think there are so many exciting things happening uh, in with younger generations of, of them just not accepting things that previous generations of women have accepted. And it's thrilling for me to see. And if I could say anything to anyone, if Nina's story is trying to say anything to anyone of any age, it's just, you don't have to accept it. You don't have to just accept things the way that they are. You don't have to accept men's opinions of what you should be doing. You don't have to accept any of it. Um, I think we're trained as, as women or um, a, lot, a lot of people are trained to just accept and I, what's exciting to me about right now and my hopes for the future is that people just stop accepting things that are unacceptable. And I think that's kind of Nina's trajectory in the story is the day that she wakes up and maybe is like, maybe I don't want to accept everything that comes my way anymore. Maybe I want to be in control. And I love that it doesn't happen. Well, never mind. I can't say when it happens because I forget that he's really bad at the spoiler thing. I just want to spoil it for everybody. <laughs> I want to talk about uh, this quote from Daisy because it, it ties into what we're talking about. But I think that everyone who's watching this, who's read Daisy, I've read Daisy, you wrote Daisy. We all know what the most famous line from Daisy Jones and the Six is. And it's that I am not somebody's muse. I am the somebody. Um, why do you think that your readers have connected to that line so much out of all the pages that you've written? And um what, is, what would be the line from, from this book that, that sticks out to you? Do you have one yet? Do you have like your cult following line from Malibu Rising? So, um, so okay, so two things. So, so with Daisy Jones and that line in particular, I will be honest, I did not know that that line was going to resonate with people the way that it did. It's really thrilling to me that it did. And to me, it speaks to the power of telling the truth as best you can because that entire scene from that from daisy jones was lifted from my life i was at barney's beanery i was on a date with a guy i made a different joke i didn't make a joke about being on uppers and downers at the same time because i'm much i'm much less cool than daisy jones but um but i made a joke and it was a joke that was at my own expense. And the guy that I was with said, oh my gosh, that's so funny. And he picked out a tiny notepad from his back pocket and he wrote it down. And he was like, that's too good. I'm gonna use that one day. And I, and here's the part that kills me is at the moment I wasn't angry. It wasn't until years later when I came to understand exactly what dynamics were, were in play that I looked back on it and I went, that asshole. It didn't occur to him that I knew 
how funny my joke was. He thought he understood something about my joke that I didn't. And he assumed that whatever came out of my mouth was for him to use in his art, that I belonged to him. I was here to serve him. Ownership thing that we're talking about that Nina's kind of realizing that you realized in that moment, it's like, but I, but I want ownership. It's just, that was my joke. And what that's, makes me, I wouldn't take that joke and write it all the way. That's uh, exactly it. Yeah. And so I, I put it in the book because I wanted to show how difficult it would be for Daisy to be taken seriously. That even when people can see that she's, she's good with a line or she's clever, that even yeah. then they're not going to respect her. And I called back to that moment and I just typed it out. And, and it was absolutely one of those moments. Sorry. I had no idea that yeah. that, that, that happened to you. Yeah. But no. it, was, it, it's one of those moments and it doesn't, it occasionally when I'm writing, I will be, I will type something and then I will see what I've typed, but I didn't, it like didn't go through. Yeah. yeah. And that's like, what that was. Like, yeah. Like, I know it's interesting like even like journaling I've done like a little bit of journaling and stuff and like sometimes you don't even really realize or you didn't you realize that you never dealt with it at the time until you physically like write something down and then you're yes. or just remembering it and you're like wait that wasn't right and I never even thought about it in that light but those things come up to you I just um saw a quote on the on the chat that it seems like that might be the new uh, I'm not the some. I'm not somebody's muse. I'm the somebody. Do you want to hear it? Yes, please. I think that the new quote from Malibu Rising. I'm going to call it now. Is it would not be her that bent and broke anymore. So that might be the new. That's quote. a good one. I like that one. I really loved writing that line. I have to say that whole scene was very um that was very cathartic for me when I was when I was typing that out like I was mad and was, uh, and it felt good <laughs> she's like crying and like <laughs> he's writing that line I think I don't want to be the one to call it but I feel like I might have just called the new cult following from Malibu Rising so you're that's welcome. a good one <laughs> that's a good one and I'm sure there's a bunch more that we're not even remembering um, cause you wrote so many lines. So how could you, but I, I highlight stuff too. When I write, I don't know if you do this, but oh, do you? Yeah. yeah, my friend, Emma Roberts, who we were just talking about has a book club, Bellatrist. And, um, she was teaching me, not teaching me, but I, I, she, she lent me one of her books. Um, and she actually got me into reading. She, thanks to her, I'm, I'm so into it now. She recommended me some books. She's a big fan of Daisy now too, but I, I opened her books when she had lent them to me and they were just all underlined. Oh, and it was that gold, gold. She underlined, she underlined everything for me. And every time I went after that to like go and underline, she had already underlined what I liked. And so I could tell them, <laughs> but, but going back, even sometimes I underline and I just go back and I'll open it. And I'll be like, what did I feel in that moment that I really kind of related to? Mm -hmm. um, a year ago I'll underline and it was like an angry line that I underlined or like you know an emotional line and I go back and I read I was like wow I was really going through it in that moment that really must have must have hit a chord but to me like both as a reader and as a writer those are the most intoxicating moments like when you come across a line that makes you feel less alone or explains yourself to you or I mean I I don't um, underline them anymore. What I do is I take a photo and then and then like point to it within the photo. And what's really nice is that then I go through my camera roll and I just like look up all these great lines from books that I loved, which has been nice. Yeah, but but it's so powerful when you find something like that. Um, that that I mean, there's nothing more fun to me when when I'm having uh, when we get to do in person events. Every once in a while, you'll have somebody in the line, and they'll say, "Oh, you know, will you sign this copy? I've had it for however many years." And it's just you'll just see it's like there's like 50 bookmarks in it, and the whole thing's scribbled. And I think they just want me to politely sign it, but I'm like, "Oh no, I have to look through this and see how you experience this book. It's so fun to me." And like the first copy that I have of Daisy, I have like notes, from like hearts and like little Camilla, like above like lines that Camilla says that I love it. Like put a little heart next to her, I put a little asterisk next to it. And it's kind of fun to like go back to memory, memory lane and like look at, yeah, what, what, what you liked in that moment. And yeah, and also 
open a book that's just been like bat- be- beaten and destroyed and it's got sand and dirt and tears and water and pop- it. things that happened when you were when you were on that journey um yeah. I have to ask you why the 80s for this one because I know that you've hit almost every other decade you can you can write about um Evelyn being you know what was it all through the fifth it was even yeah, like early- 50, 60s yeah and then you go right into Daisy, which is like late 60s, early 70s. And now you're yeah. like late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. And I just foreshadow something. Is the next one going to be like late 90s, early 2000s? You're on to me. You're, you're, oh. you're piecing it together faster than anybody. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I really see the four, these four books, which is to say Evelyn Hugo, Daisy Jones, Malibu Rising in my next one as a quartet that, that fit together and they're all about famous women and it'll be 60s, 70s, 80s, and, and 90s. And then was, what happens from there, I don't know. I was totally guessing. I didn't actually think that you were gonna say <laughs> But I guess I did finally catch on to some sort of secret. So you're, you're welcome. You're on to me, yes. And the next book is about an only child in the late 90s. You're yep. welcome. <laughs> thank me later. But but is there something, uh, a re- I mean, I, I get the reason, but. I wasn't alive in the eighties, so you can tell me a little bit about how I don't know. Were you alive in the eighties? I don't want to eat. I was alive in the eighties. I was born uh, just a few months after this party, so um, yeah. Really, really, what it is about the eighties in particular, and eighties beach culture that seemed really fun to me, is that um, is that eighties are just this period of time of excess where people seem to have shrugged off any sense of of responsibility from earlier and it was entirely about um you know and i'm i'm grossly generalizing an entire decade of time and people which you know but as much as you can yeah um and and so what i wanted to do is i wanted to set this party during the early 80s before we get into the more um you know like like Wall Street, greed is good, really intense 80s excess, when that feeling was percolating, when there was a shift in the culture. And so uh, I settled on 1983. I watched watched this documentary. Uh, It was a CNN documentary. And it's like 10 episodes. And each episode is um, an aspect of the 80s. And I took so many notes. And I was like, Okay, according to my calculations, the best year for this is 1983. Um, and, and just then based every cultural piece around that. And, you know, it's just the fashion was was sort of over the top and crazy. And the celebrities that were starting to be huge were really fun. And yeah. so it just felt it just felt right for a party of of wild destruction to be set in this period of time that is so known and for excess. Final destruction, it, it is. You guys are for, for the party of a decade, maybe even of a century. So put your boots on people. Um, do you surf? And what is this relationship to surf? Because I don't surf and everyone's like, oh, you're from California and you or you're or you're from Los Angeles. You must be a great surfer. I'm like, if I got on a surfboard, I would really hurt myself or I'd hurt other people. Yes. So you write so well about surfing not being a surfer uh i am really good at pretending i i you know it's it's it's, yeah you get me um it's what what it is is that i get really really interested in something and throw myself into it and so i knew nothing about 70s rock before i wrote daisy jones i i mean i did actually know a little bit about um Hollywood before writing Evelyn Hugo because I've worked in it for as long as I have. But um, for this one, I just thought surfers are cool and I want to be at the ocean and I want to feel like I'm at the ocean. So I'm going to write this story. And I just devoured content about it. I read the most beautiful books. Barbarian Days is a book about surfing by William Finnegan. It's really great, very meditative. Um, And and actually, you know, my manager brad who's one of the eps on daisy jones brad mendelson and he's a surfer he has surfed his whole life and specifically surfed malibu in the 80s and so i made him 
sit down with me. And I interviewed him for like two and a half hours and, and just asked him absolutely everything. So we owe a lot of the surfing to Brad. Thanks Brad for all the surf, surf tips. Did you um, ever go to Malibu in this process of writing this and like sit there and put your feet in the water and like get oh, the, yeah. snack, the tastes and the textures and the whole thing? All of it. I love being in Malibu. I go there all the time. Um, this was such a great excuse to go there more. Um, yeah. You know, I would I would like rent a place on the on the shoreline for a week and listen to the sounds and yeah. try to remember the things that like I would close my eyes and, and try to focus on the most telling things that were happening in terms of smell and sound and make notes about that. And I think, I hope that it shows in, in the writing because it really is one of my favorite places on the planet. I think it is so exceptionally beautiful and I want to be able to, to bring people there. And so, and, and also I wanted a good excuse to go there myself. So I spent a lot, I spent a lot of time there and still do on the weekend. I admit that you wrote this book solely that you so you could rent a house and have an excuse to rent a house on the shoreline of Malibu, and you were probably just like having a glass of wine, relaxing, living your best life, and you blame it on writing writing I mean, Malibu. It's a business expense. It's a business expense. You had to, it had to be done. No, um, we should get out on some surfboards. It's kind of pathetic that we've been here for so long and we can't surf for the life I, of us. I I know I will make a fool of myself, but Brad has assured me that he will take out and teach anybody we want. So you and I can hit up Brad and he'll teach us. God, we really, really, really need it. Um, so Mick is is connected in Evelyn, Daisy, Matt, and, and Mal the Rising. Are there any other fun cameos that we can look out for? Is there anything that we didn't pick up on that I should know about? There are some good cameos in here. There's people from um, Daisy Jones and the Six in here. Uh, there's, a mention of Celia St. James in here. There's, um, I, I, I caught that. Yeah. There's, if, if people are, are, if people want to have fun with it, there's, there's a few and there's sometimes even more than it seems at first glance. I've, I've layered them in. It's for what I didn't mean to become a person who's self-referencing within books that wasn't my intention but it's just become so much fun celia wasn't it you're right and there was even don adler yes yes there was a re <laughs> yeah you're very good you got this you have like a fan following that could like dissect and and find all like the cameos that are secretly put in there that should be like your thing to secretly put people throughout all your books and sprinkle them and then like have competitions of who can find the most connections. That's, yeah. that's a good idea, Taylor. Um, oh, I've already asked a question of what's next for you because I was able to decipher that code early. Yeah, very so, good. This feels like a good time to ask questions, take questions from, from the crowd, from our people. Let's do it. Because I'm sure they have a lot of questions that are much better than my questions. So ask us questions, guys. This is the time. Let's see. We've got a lot of a lot here in the Q and A. Oh, I can answer this one because I'm excited about it. When does production start on Daisy Jones and the Six? So I'm very excited about this. Taylor's very excited about this. We um, were supposed to start March of last year, and of course we had a pandemic, and now we are only a couple months away, and at the end of September, we will be on our first day of Daisy Jones and the Six, which it feels like it's been forever waiting for this to happen since the day that I booked it and the day that you know I attached and Taylor and I met and all that happened. So we're a couple months away, people. But very, very exciting. I, very. I like, and, and also just that, we've kept the whole cast and you guys have have all like i i just i find it so endearing like when i'm looking through like your stories or riley's stories and like you guys are like supporting each other and it just makes me so happy you guys a little i'll give you guys a little sneak peek of my phone there may or may not be a daisy jones in the sixth group chat that's already happened and that has been happening for a year and a half we're all in a group chat called Daisy Jones and the seven, because we have a seven. Um, 
So that that's exciting. And yeah, we've all stayed friends and we've all, all been able to um, keep a little life going and talk about the book and talk about the project. So yeah. I love Next it. Question. What do we have here? Um, so I'm building for you. Do you see anything that you want to answer? We can, um, I'm right at the top where uh, people started asking early. Um, oh, I like this. What was your yeah. favorite book you've written so far? Oh, I mean, impossible. Come on. It's totally impossible. It's like when people say, I love all my children, but you know, they secretly have a favorite child. Yeah. But see, I only have one child, so I'm not even lying about that. Um, so I, I will say this. I, I will say that um, that Evelyn Hugo as a person, her character in particular, has stuck with me for a really long time. Um, but the Riva family are people that I just feel like I could write forever. And so I, I do really miss them a lot right now. Um, character to learn from she was she's so cutthroat and, and and she's so unapologetically hardcore and savage and will do anything to get where she wants it's a part yeah. of it that I admire a part of it I'm quite afraid of it she's I terrifying she's <laughs> a little bit more Evelyn Hugo in me of like if I want something I can get it yeah. she goes she she does it till the world stops spinning but um yeah, yeah there's she's there's a pretty good question here, which, which I'm kind of loving, which is one Goodreads reader posted the following question about Malibu Rising. Is it gay? The four answers are variations on just a little. What does this mean? And I feel like what what is being asked is, is are there gay people in this book? And there are. So just know, Joe K, that I'm always writing about, um, about people that haven't traditionally fit inside the mainstream. And I'm always thinking about that. And I think. I'd we'll like to hear who their guesses are and who could be gay in Rising. Who do we think? Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. But, but yes, I will, I will show up and always put a, at least one gay person and probably almost everything because it's something that's very important to me. Let's see. Oh, is there a chance to see any of your other characters in the next book. I feel like we answered that. I feel like you're going to keep dropping little droplets of. Yeah. Yes. It's almost a happy pride month, y'all. Happy pride hey, month. Hey. Well, here's one for you. I think this is great. How how are you preparing for your role as Camila? Oh, as my role of Camila, you know, to be honest, I haven't really done prep because we were so close to going last time and I had done all my prep then and now I'm kind of like you know a year and a half later I have to start over with my process but um a big part of what I will do I kind of you know imagine Camilla as this like Laurel Canyon uh, you know barefoot earth hippie who it's even just like a physical thing to me like to her to me her feet are just always so planted in the ground and I know that that's then not really an answer, but like for me, whenever I feel like I might lose her, or might not really understand, it's like to feel her feet on the ground. That's her aspect. That's who she is in every part of her life, how she handles Billy, how she handles the kids, how she handles her heartbreak. Um, yeah, she's just a really good woman, but I'm going to have to find in myself, you know, how she takes Billy back. And there's, there's quite, quite, um, I have to do a lot of internal searching on, on how I would feel. And if that were done to me and, and find forgiveness and the most important thing is just to never judge a character so i never judge anyone that i'm playing i have to like see why they did what they did and, and defend it so that'll be kind that. of i love that um let's see there's another question um for both of us which is what was it like meeting the daisy jones cast um which you you've met more people than i have i've i've met you and riley and um and and I, but I haven't, I haven't met Sam and I haven't met Suki. Like I'm excited to meet them, but you guys have formed like your own. We like, are all like a little, a little family. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. We really were like just about to go and then everything happened, you know, with the pandemic or else you would have met everyone. And 
And I, I got to audition um, Josh Whitehouse, which was fun. Um, he just seems like the cutest. Yeah, he's awesome. He can tell people who he's playing. Um, yeah, and then I got to audition with Riley when I almost had the job. They brought in Riley to do a chemistry read to see how Riley and I would do together. And then I also got to chemistry read with Sam. And with all of them, we just had really great chemistry. And then we've had a, we had a camping trip planned that got canceled a couple of times. Really? And then, yeah, I haven't gotten to meet in some of the other Asuki I've known. Um, and then, yeah, I still have like three or four people left to meet. So everyone seems very cool. And, and the other thing too, is like from the auditions that I saw, um, not only do you guys have great chemistry, which is great, but also there's just like a, a sort of essentialness that I feel like in the, in the chemistry reads that I saw with you and, and Sam and you and Riley, like all three of you have like an essential, like an innateness that works so well with your character that um it just i don't know it, your your auditions i there were like multiple times when i was like oh i'm getting misty and it's just an audition tape but you guys yeah. have, just have well, yeah, very good chemistry good so let's hope that we achieve that this is a this is a good question um out of all your characters who would you want to spend the day with taylor Oh boy. Well, I can, t I can tell you that it's not Evelyn Hugo or Daisy Jones because I'm much more low key, even though I love them. Um, they would tire me out to, to be honest, there's a part of me that thinks that like me and Harry Cameron would just be like super cool oh. together. You know, I really love him. Um, but, but it's probably, um, it's probably HUD. I just love HUD from Malibu Rising, I just, I, he's just a sweetheart. And I don't know, maybe he reminds me of my own brother a little bit, but I just, uh, I just have such affection for him. And he's, um, he, he would not be a very intense person <laughs> the way that Evelyn Hugo, like you were saying, like, she's a little scary. And I, she I would, yeah. I want to meet yeah. Or I want to meet Daisy too. I think Daisy's so badass and she's so like naturally cool and everything that I'm not. So I would basically <laughs> want to meet. She just has this like cool Stevie Nicks like ease to her that yeah. I wish that I had. So I would want to like hang with her and have some of that um, rub, off. rub off on me. I get it. I love it. Oh, I heard Aurora. What is some, what is? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Aurora. I know everyone's like, release Aurora. I'm like, I've heard it guys, you will be excited. <laughs> it's very good. The music is very good. Yeah. Oh, people are from Argentina. I was just seeing that. That one, Taylor, ¿Cuál persona femenina disfrutaste más escribir? Oh, that's a cool question. Um, Catalina Raco said, which feminine uh, person was your favorite to write? But I guess we've talked, I guess we haven't talked about which one's your favorite to write. Um, you know what? Evelyn Hugo was really, really fun to write for me as, a, as like in my career, the first time where I created a character that felt larger than life. But in this book, I have to say, Nina offered me an opportunity to write closer to the way I see the world. And mm -hmm. it, it allowed more of me to shine through than ever before. And it was really um, a, a, a sort of lovely experience. And I think, I think because of that, I feel like I know Nina better than I know anybody else. It feels like a more real person that either we could be or like someone that we know. Evelyn feels very like a little bit far from like anyone you come across on a day-to-day day -day basis. Yeah. Still very cool and complex, but she's more of like a rare one in a million. She's, she, it's a much more heightened character. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. And, and that's why Nina feels just a little bit more raw to me too. And it was a real pleasure to get to 
create her and tell her story and take her on this particular journey because there were so many things that I wanted for her and it was it felt really good to see her you know really realize for the first time that maybe she deserves some of them mm -hmm. Oh, I just want to say something cool to you, Taylor, that um, I had posted an Instagram a couple months ago showing all the books that I read in quarantine. I said, I'm out of books. You know, these are the only ones I knew um, to read. Which one, uh, which one should I read? And, and I read the comments, um, which I, I don't often do. And I asked for recommendations and almost every comment said one of your books. Oh, so I, that's so um, nice. That was a really nice um, thing that I, I hope makes you feel good. That does make me feel good. And and the next time you need book recommendations, let me know because there are so many, I mean, even just this summer, there are so many incredible books being released this summer. It's just an embarrassment of riches. And so if there are people that, that love to read or you know want to read more, this is the time. There's some good stuff out there. Um. Do you have any good questions? People, things come in so fast. I'm like, I'm I know like, there's so there's so many of them, and some of them are um, long. And so I want to. I, I like this question that says, "Did you mean to make Hud Riva literally the perfect man, or was that just a coincidence?" Which cracks me up. If, you know what? If you like Hud Riva, you should meet Jake Jenkins, my brother, <laughs> because they're not dissimilar. People. <laughs> Jenkins single you can you can recommend he, him he is single and uh you know what well I'll just he would kill me he would kill me but I'll just put his photo up on my Instagram and you can all um put his number in the chat yeah. and you can have <laughs> he would not find that charming if I did that someone said Malibu Rising initially had a different title can you talk about the name change what was that like yeah. I didn't know Yes. Yeah, so it was initially from the very, I mean, I pitched it from the day that I pitched it years ago was called Malibu burning. And, oh. um, when the, um, when the, when Malibu caught fire at the end of 2018, I think it was November of 2018. Um, I was concerned that the title would be insensitive to the people who you know lost their homes from this fire in Malibu and I was on the fence about it because the book makes it very clear how much respect I have I think for the land and the people who live there but I just um it it was a few months before we were gonna start printing this book and the Malibu caught fire again and I just felt very strongly that it was not worth doing anything that could be conceived of as insensitive to the people that lived there. And so we, I, I had always in my mind seen it as Malibu burning is the story of a fire, right? And fire is two things. It's, it's the burning and then it's what rises from those ashes. And so it became really easy to me to just say, okay, well, let's just, you know, same metaphor and let's just flip it. So now we have Malibu rising and I don't even, rem I forget that it was called Malibu burning for so long. Well, I didn't know and I think that's a good choice. You know, being from here, we know how sensitive kind of what happens over on like that side of, of our coast is. And you know, the book's so not so not about that, but I understand right. how people could initially see that. And yeah. All right, do you have anything else? Hey, we can we can pick maybe one more. Um, give us your best questions. Yeah, let's let's go through. Maybe we can find, you know what, let's, we can, I think this is a good one for both of us to end on, which is what part of Daisy Jones and the Six from the book are you most excited to see come to life on the show? Um, do you have, do you have a part that you're excited to play or a, a part of your character that you're excited for or something? I can think of a few for myself. I'll let you start. Okay. Um, I am truly, uh, very, very excited to see this band play together. 
I think that um, part of what's been so satisfying for me is that I made up a fake band. They weren't real and now they're becoming real. And Blake Mills is doing this incredible music. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. And then the other piece that I'm really excited about is that uh, I, I think there's an incredible kinship that exists between Camila and Karen. And also a, a number of ways that the relationship between Camila and Daisy could have gone. And what I'm excited to see is these three very different women. And if you add Simone in there, now it's four different women pursuing what they want, even though those four women have four very different desires. Yeah. And I'm excited to see that. I'm excited for a lot of things. I mean, as an actor, there's certain uh, scenes that are more challenging that I'm like excited for. You know, when I when I catch Billy having an affair and and when I give birth to our first child and he's not there, there's a couple things that, you know, are, are hard scenes to do. So I'm excited for those, but I'm also excited for the scenes with Riley and uh, Daisy and, you know, how, this love triangle is going to um, form on camera. Yeah, I I have no doubt it's going to be very juicy. And I think you guys are so all perfectly cast for it. Something that I've talked about in other interviews is that, you know, before I was a writer, I was um, I was a casting assistant. So I worked in a casting office. And um, so I know like how special it is when actors have chemistry, when you find the exact right person for the role, it doesn't always happen. It's so much work the casting director is doing to put that together. And I just can't tell you, like from a casting perspective, I am just thrilled and very excited to see what you guys do with it. Yay. Um, I'm excited too. I just can't wait to get it. Um, to get in it, but I don't know what's happening. This is what happens at the end of the day. Um, Congratulations, Taylor, really on an amazing success. And I can't wait for the world to read this and, and to have this in their hands and all the praise and great things that will come of this book and then all the things that you write next, even though I've already predicted all of them. So you guys <laughs> message me for all of my predictions. Um, and yeah, just congratulations and thank you for having me. And, and this is the first one of these I've ever done and I had a great time. Well, you did a great job and I really appreciate you doing it because it's been it's been great to get to talk about about Daisy Jones with you. And I'm so excited for you guys to start shooting and, you know, very soon enough, you know, you'll be on set. I'll come visit. I'll sign your book. We'll do the whole thing. But in the meantime, it's just been so fun to get to talk to you. You too. And thank you everyone for asking questions and um, coming to watch Taylor and I talk. Yes, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.